So tonight's message is called The Fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Fruit of the Holy Spirit. On November 6th, obviously 2020, just a week or so ago, um, I was walking in a large lot of land, and everything on this lot of land, so just imagine this, we'll just consider this room for just a moment. Imagine everything in here was a big lot of land, and everything on the land was dead. All the grass, all the bushes, everything was dead except for two small trees. I'm talking like little guys, like little baby trees, right? But because everything surrounding these two trees was so dead, these two trees just literally just stood up above everything. They were beautiful to the eye, like they really brought beauty to this dead lot. Okay? I was at this lot, guys, to cut down all of the dead. Everything that wasn't producing, I was sent there in my dream to cut it away, to remove it, right? These two trees that were up there were were beautiful. They They were left untouched, had nothing to do. They were growing just fine. They were producing fruit. I had nothing to do there except cut everything dead around them away, okay? But as I looked upon these two trees, I still remember to this day there was five pieces of fruit. Every branch on these two trees were bearing every one of them and they were good good fruit like really good fruit like fruit that I've never seen before in my life I knew what they were this one tree on the right had four apples you guys ever seen those honey crisp apples right they got all those cool little colors in them red and beautiful four of them and then on the left side there was it was a peach tree and it only had one branch again these were small little guys but it was producing fruit and that peach was it was nice i was like man that's going to taste wonderful but i didn't touch them but in the midst of all the dead things they stood out more than anything in that field because they had life everything surrounding them was dead but these trees though small had a whole lot of life and they were producing really really good fruit There is a day coming, my brothers and sisters, when the trees that are not producing good fruit will be cut down and cast into the fire. The trees that are not producing fruit. Remember, I was there to do a job. I was there to cut down everything that was dead and remove it. That was my job. But the trees that were producing left them untouched. They were doing their job, right? So there's a day coming that every tree that's not producing good fruit will be cut down and thrown in the fire. And those that are, the trees that are producing good fruit, will bring glory to God the Father. That's the difference. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, it says this, it's written, And now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which brings not forth good fruit is cut down or hewn down and cast into the fire. If you recall, that was John the Baptist sitting in the river baptizing and all of these religious Pharisees and Sadducees showed up to the baptism. And what did he say? Who told you snakes about the coming wrath? Who told you guys about that? And he says, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Let there be some evidence in your life that you've in fact repented. And then what did he say? He said, the axe is laid to the root. If there's any, a, a scarier place that axe could be, it's at the root. Why? Because if you cut off that root, you kill it. And that's what he was saying. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. If you are not producing fruit, you will be cut off. But on the flip side, in John 15, 8, Jesus says, it is written, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So what is the purpose of fruit? Well, it gives glory to God. It gives glory to God. Listen, there's a verse in the Bible, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, it's written again, to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. You get to find that as fruits. Let them see your good works, Right? When they see your good works, what are they going to do? They're going to glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Just like Jesus says in John 15, 8, herein is my Father glorified. Herein is He honored. Herein is He praised when we bear much fruit. 
And so in Matthew 5.16, when people see our good works, when they see Jesus in us, people will turn and say, wow, God, I see I'm a witness of what you're doing in that person's life. Do you see? So just like those two trees, those small, they were producing some really nice fruit and they stood out amongst everything that was dead because they had life. Just like every Christian should have life amongst all of those in the world that are dead. There should be something different about you compared to the rest of the world. Amen? Amen. In Matthew chapter 7, would you please turn there? Matthew chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 15. Okay. So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to go from 15 through 20. Okay? You guys there with me? Praise the Lord. I want you to see God's Word. I'm good with it. Take as much time as you need. You need to see it for yourself. Okay. Okay. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. It is written, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Verse 20, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. I understand the context of this. Jesus opens up by saying, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It's talking about false teachers. And what Jesus is saying is that you could spot a false teacher by their fruits, though they come to you clothed in sheepskin. Though they seem like they're non-threatening, that, that, that everything that they're doing, they're so godly, they're, you know, they're, they're full of light. But according to their fruits, you'll be able to spot them. And then Jesus goes on to say simply that you can tell what a tree is according to its fruits. Quick question. How do you know that an apple tree is an apple tree? How do you know an orange tree is an orange tree? Or a banana tree a banana tree? By its fruits that it bear. Does that make sense? This is what Jesus is saying. Don't make it crazy difficult. Don't be confused. This is simple. You can tell what kind of tree it is according to their fruits. Just like you can walk up and say, oh, that's an orange tree. Oh, that's a, a pear tree. Oh, that's this. Oh, that's that. Oh, that's... You can tell by its fruits that it's producing what kind of tree it is, right? So if the tree is corrupt, so will be the fruit. If the tree is corrupt, so will be the fruit. But if the tree is good, so will be the fruit. Simple, yes? Jesus says that the good cannot bring forth evil, neither evil good. This is a great truth because it eliminates confusion. Well, I serve Jesus on the weekend, right? And I go to church. Every time they're open, I go to church. I'm not producing any good fruit whatsoever. I mean, I may have a nice little fruit every once in a while, but I'm kind of back and forth and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Jesus said, no, 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 no. A good tree does not produce bad fruit. A bad tree does not produce good fruit. So what do we do? Well, thank you, Lord Jesus, for clearing it all up for us. If there's bad fruit, then the tree's corrupt. If there's good fruit, then the tree's good. Plain and simple, right? You can't produce, oh, well, it's a banana tree, but it's producing oranges right now. It's the weirdest thing. Is it a banana tree or is it an orange tree? Which one is it? Well, it's an apple slash banana tree. That doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. 
So according to Jesus, you can know others by their fruits. Do you believe that? Okay. But instead of looking at your neighbor's tree, because we could all look and say, oh, let me, let's inspect Darlene. Let's inspect her. Let's start looking at the fruits that she's bearing. Let's put her on blast, right? No, no, no don't look at me. Let's look at her. <laughs> instead of looking at our neighbor's trees, instead of looking at their branches and inspecting what they're bearing, let's look at our own tree. Let's look at our own tree. Let's look at our own branches. What kind of tree are you? This is the time where you don't look to the right or the left, husbands and wives and friends and brothers and sisters. You look straight at... You, we should probably just pull out a bunch of mirrors right now. That's what I should have done. I should have bought a bunch of mirrors so that you could check out yourself. So you can, you can put on some self-examination. It's like, oh, well, wait a second. I want to look at my neighbor because I think I'm a lot better than they are. What is your tree? I didn't ask you to look at your neighbor. Look at yourself. Examine your branches. Right? Okay. So are you a good tree producing good fruit or are you a corrupt tree producing bad fruit? Only you know. Now, yes, Jesus says you'll know them by the fruits. Can I look at you and determine? Sure can. Jesus called me to be a fruit inspector just like he's called you to be a fruit inspector. Just like as I'm sitting up here giving God's word to you, studying God's word with you, you should be able to see right through me and say, yeah, Cody preaches this, but on the weekends, he's out here getting drunk. On the weekends, he's up over here hanging around doing something he's not supposed to be doing. He's cheating on his wife. He's up over here, still has a porn addiction. He's up over here, still lying and stealing and doing all this, and he's cheating on his timesheet at work. I know who he is. Right? So you could see right through it. That's why Jesus says, because the fruits of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit are clearly visible. I could see him. You could see him. That's one of the greatest weapons that we have against false teaching, against false doctrines, against false prophets. Tell me, you that got all this power, you could lay hands on the sick and they recover, you could cast out demons, you could speak in tongues, and you could do all this stuff, but you have no power over sin. You're producing no fruits of the Holy Spirit other than we see some power. Well, I believe in God and Jesus would tell you, so do the devils and they tremble. Do you see? Look at their fruits. We could be promoting so much so, just like Jesus says, you have this name that you're alive, but you're dead. Why? I see your fruits. But remember, this is not the time to look at somebody else's fruits. Well, I'm going to look at my sister's fruit. I'm going to look at my brother's fruit. Let's find out what they're about. No, no, no. Look at yourself. Self-examination time. Self-examination time. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Don't turn there. Just listen to me for a moment. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, examine yourselves whether or not you're in the faith. Paul says, examine yourself whether or not you're in the faith. Prove your own self. Don't you know your own self? How that Jesus is in you? Except you be reprobates, except you be condemned, shouldn't you of all people know whether or not you are alive in Christ or whether you're dead in sin? I don't got to come search you out. You know that. You don't have to tell me the truth about it, but you know that. And why is it important to examine our branches? Come on. What's the whole purpose of this? It's like, man, I wasn't really interested in coming and examining myself. I wanted to hear messages about other people, right? Because, guys, if we don't examine ourselves now with the breath and the grace of God that we have today, if we don't examine ourselves, we may come to that day where God comes and lays every axe on every root of every tree and cuts it down because they're not producing any fruits. So it's important for self-examination to take place that you look within and say, hold on a second, am I producing good fruit or am I producing evil fruit? Why? Because if I'm not... Wow, thank you, Lord, I get one more opportunity to change that around. I get another opportunity to do something different, right? Amen. We're taking advantage of that time. So it's important to, to, to inspect 
or examine our branches, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to examine yourselves whether or not you're in the faith. It's important to inspect our branches because, again, if we're not producing fruit, we'll be cut down and thrown in the fire. And I would like personally like to take advantage of God's grace and God's patience that He's given us today to be changed if needed. I'm good with that. And there's people in here that are bearing wonderful fruits for Jesus, that are bright, shining lights, cities on hills, light in the darkness, Salt to an earth that has no flavor. There are plenty of people in here that I know personally that you are just bearing and producing all kinds of fruit for the kingdom of God that's affecting others in a good way. Right? So if there needs to be change, there needs to be change. But most importantly, I want to bear fruit. You should want to bear fruit so that we can bring glory to God's name. That we can bring Him glory, not ourselves. I'm not interested in being a bright, shining light so that you can praise me. I won't accept your praise. I won't accept your compliments. Ask anybody who's been in here for a while. I'm not good with them. I'm not interested in receiving them. Praise God. Praise God. Amen? Okay. So what is fruit? We've been talking about this fruit thing. Okay, my bearing good fruits and my bearing... Okay, so fruit, let me define this for you so that we remember throughout the message. Fruit is your works, your actions, your deeds. Fruit is literally an attribute, a characteristic. It's what defines you, who you are. Does that make sense? So a fruit is literally an attribute. For example, we define God by attributes, yes? Who is God? Well, He's a God of mercy. He's a God of patience. He's a God of all comfort. Right? We can start going down the line. God is, is truth. He's not the, he is truth, right? It's not a concept, it's a person. Does that make sense? They're attributes that define you who you are. They define your lifestyle. So as we go through these things, are these fruits, are these characteristics, are these attributes in your life, and do they define you? For example, if I was a drunkard, then you can define my fruits that I bear of drunkenness. Well, what is Cody? Well, he's a drunkard. That's an attribute that defines me. Do you see where I'm going with this? So it's a characteristic. It's an attribute of your life. That's what, a, that's what the fruit is. So if you're bearing good fruits, you're bearing good fruits that are good attributes, heavenly attributes, godly attributes, compared to bearing attributes or characteristics of, of wicked things, of the things of the devil and not the things of God. Does that make sense? So that's what fruits are. So as we go through, examine your attributes. Examine what defines you as a believer or as an unbeliever. What defines you? So let's examine our own trees tonight. Please turn to Galatians chapter 5. Let's examine our branches. Examine our branches. Again, tonight's message is called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. You guys in Galatians chapter 5? Okay, let's start in verse 19. Let's start in verse 19. Verse 19, Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like of which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you guys capture all of those? Probably not. Did you know what all of those mean? Probably not. Right? It's like, oh yeah, revelings. It's a, probably not. Praise the Lord. Let's go through them. Remember, tonight's a, a time of self-examination. Tonight's a time, according to Paul, to examine. I want to look at my branches. God, am I bearing any of this on my branches? If so, I want it gone. I need to be uprooted. I need a new branch. I need a new tree. I need a new source of life, right? Because I'm dead. I'm not producing any fruit. So, 
You have the fruit of the flesh, which is the evil, corrupt flesh. The evil, corrupt characteristics and attributes right, of the flesh. And then you have the fruit of the Spirit, which is, is the good, the attributes, the characteristics of somebody who is in Christ. Okay, So let's look at the evil, corrupt fruits of the flesh. And now let's start examining. Okay, In verse 19, again, the works of the flesh are manifest. That word manifest literally means clearly visible. So you don't have to dig up some dirt and remove a rock and look under somewhere to see whether or not you're bearing any of these fruits, whether any of these attributes define you. These wicked fruits of the flesh are clearly visible. Not just to you, not just to me, but most importantly, visible to God. They're clearly visible. So, which are these? Adultery. Well, let's talk about adultery, then it's going to go on to fornication. Let's cover both of those at the same time. So adultery and fornication, we can define those as sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, which can be from pornography to adultery to homosexuality, bestiality, pedophilia, right? We could just go down the list. Sexual immorality is all-encompassing. Now, adultery is not just as according to what Jesus says. When you look at a woman you've lusted after, you've already committed adultery in your heart. You see the problem of the, the, the issue of grace here. The, the standard of grace that Jesus has put is that before you just had to sleep with somebody else's wife and commit the act of adultery, then you were guilty. But now, Jesus says, if you even look at another woman and you lust after her, you've already done the act without even doing it. So you see that the law, Jesus is making it harder. What's He doing? He's pushing us to Himself because we need to realize that we cannot do that. I need help with that, right? So we know that adultery is there, but also adultery is also defined as a man marrying a divorced woman or a man divorcing his wife for any other reason than sexual immorality. Or if the unbeliever leaves the believer, then the believer is free. That covenant's removed. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we see that if a woman departs from her husband, he says, don't let the woman depart from her husband, but if she departs, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And then you read Romans chapter 7, which says that those who know the law are going to understand what I'm saying, right? Because he says those that are, the woman is bound by law to her husband as long as he's alive. So then if she goes and gets married to another, she shall be considered an adulteress. And whoever marries a divorced woman shall be considered an adulterer. That's adultery. You probably don't hear that a lot. But that's adultery. That's sexual immorality. So is there any of us, start looking at your branches now. Are we still dealing with porn? Are we having sex outside of marriage? Are we, are we in, a, in, a, in a marriage we should have never gotten to? Are we um, in, in, in pedophilia, child porn, uh, bestiality, sex with animals, all that kind of stuff? There's a bunch of wickedness. There's a bunch of wickedness. Sexual immorality is all-encompassing. Do you see this? So, look at your branches. Is there any sexual immorality on them? And then he goes on to say, their adultery, fornication, uncleanness. Well, let's look at uncleanness. Uncleanness is literally defined as impure morally. Your behavior is wrong. You have impure behaviors. Immoral behaviors. And then it goes on to say, so adultery, fornication, uncleanness, then lasciviousness. Now, this lasciviousness is a big word, and it means a whole lot. It's, it's a shameless, outrageous conduct. It's shocking to decency. It's sin that says, I don't care if you see me or you don't. I don't care what the world thinks about my wickedness. I do it anyway. It's a shameless, outrageous conduct of the flesh. Lasciviousness. And I'll give you one more. So there's no moral integrity. There's no kindness. There's no goodwill towards anybody else. Nothing. Lasciviousness. It's, it's a shamelessness about wickedness. It's a shamelessness about sin. And then verse 20, idolatry. We've heard that one before, right? 
It's a worship of false gods. It's, it's a respect. It's an honor. It's a devotion to things that are not God. We were talking about that earlier. What about worshiping race cars? What about worshiping sports or honoring sports? What about worshiping people in the White House? What about worshiping your vehicle or your house or your job or your money or your wife or your husband? What about devoting who you are to them? When Jesus clearly says, if you put mother, brother, father, sister, anybody before me, you're not worthy of me. I've done plenty. I've, I, I've committed the sin of idolatry a bunch. Because before Christ, I worship women, sex, porn, drugs, alcohol. My big old fancy truck with my 20-inch rims on it that I would get mad at, at God if it rained because I just cleaned my rims. Or my money. Or people. Or celebrities. Or sports. You can ask my dad. I've been wrestling. I've been playing sports since I was seven years old. I got three or four hundred medals sitting inside my, 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 my garage right now collecting dust, doing nothing. Blood, sweat, tears, all for that. Wrestling, fighting in the cage, baseball, football, um, whatever other sports I played, I can't remember now, surprisingly. But they're all just collecting dust. I gave my life away for those things. I went without sleep for those things. I would go without eating for those things because they meant something to me. But I went to church at least for one hour a week on Sunday. I gave God his time. Amen. <clears throat> idolatry. How many of us has committed that? And not just committed it. Sure, we all have committed the sin of idolatry. But how many of us have that as a characteristic on our branch right now that we're idolizing anything else other than God? Amen. Examine your branches. And so it goes on to say idolatry. And then it says witchcraft. Witchcraft is defined as sorcery. It's defined as magic. Magic is not okay. Divination is not okay. Speaking to the dead. Necromancing is not okay. Halloween's not okay. It's not. None of that is okay. Reading a horoscope's not okay. Witchcraft. Divination. Let's watch 50 movies by Disney that talk all about witchcraft and all of the demonic realm and all of the magic. And we just said our kids, hey, go watch this whole thing. You're going to love it. Frozen, yeah, it's a bun about a witch, a good, a white witch that could do all these different things with, with for, oh man, you should just, no, no. Oh, that's the meanest dad in the world. My kids will never go to Disneyland. What? They haven't lived. No, they're getting ready for heaven. That's even better than Disneyland. Disneyland sucks in comparison to heaven, to the kingdom of God. The people like to say it's heaven on earth, it's the paradise on earth. Not for me, bro. You keep all that and your high prices and your $50 sodas. And no, nope, you go for that, dude. I would rather have Jesus. But there's witchcraft. Are we practicing or dabbling in any of that? Well, no, I don't have a ball in my house and I don't play with a Ouija board and I'm not going to a tarot card reader or re have my palms read. Witchcraft. But I like to read my horoscopes. What is the universe telling me today? Skip that. You have to ask yourself a question. Do I want to know what the creation says about me or do I want to know what the Creator says about me? I would rather know what the Creator says about me than the creation. Forget the creation. It's like I told Brother Lee, I praise the Lord. Brother Lee, you're not going to judge me, bro. You won't be, you will not sit in the throne when I get judged. I won't sit in the throne when you're getting judged. I'm going to sit there and be like, yeah, get him. Get him. <laughs> yep, you remember that one time? I'm just trying to help you out. Remember that one time? I will not stand before you. So you don't have to worry about me. It's God you should worry about. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. Amen? So witchcraft, is that on your tree? And then it goes on to say hatred. Well, hatred is defined as hostility. Do you have any hostility going on right now toward anybody else? You hostile? 
Then variance. Variance is defined as, as, as you're full of contention. You're full of arguing and strife. That's just the type of person you are. I like to argue about everything, right? Anybody have that hanging out on their branches right now? Emulation. Emulation is, is, is outbursts. Emulation is jealousy. You have any jealousy going on right now? What about wrath? Wrath is defined as anger that boils over. Anybody got anger that boils over? Well, let me ask you this. On your way to church tonight, how was your driving? Anybody cut you off, you get mad? Did your anger start to boil over? Did you get upset because homeboy jumped in and did this and did that? No? Right? Let's, let's, let's start checking hearts, right? Praise the Lord. Keep looking at your branches. You got any anger that boils over? Are you defined? Is the characteristic of you an angry person? Think about that. Let's keep going. Okay. So we went through idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath. Now let's go on to strife. Strife is contending against God and it's self-seeking. How is that? What do, they, what do you mean contending against God? Because it's all about you. It's all about your selfish self. Everything you do is about you. And I've heard it. How you can be better, stronger, faster, make more money, uh, uh, succeed, be prosperous, have a, a nice fancy home, a good bank account, a nice 401k, how you can get up on the system and come against the man and do all... Everything is about you. So you are contending against God. You don't want God to sit on the throne of your heart. You want to sit on the throne of your heart. You're a lover of pleasure and a lover of self more than the lover of God. Is that a wicked fruit that's being born on your tree right now? So that was strife. What about seditions? Seditions is those that cause division. Is that one of your characteristics? You like to divide? Read about the abominations in the book of Proverbs. One that caused division. What? Between brothers. God hates that. It's an abomination. Sedition. What about heresies? It's literally defined as a self-chosen op opinion which causes dissensions, disagreements, quarreling, contentions. That's the definition of it in the Greek. What about envying? Verse 21. Envying. It's a grudge. It's spite towards somebody. It's having ill will towards another human being. Do you have that growing on your tree? What about murders? What about murders? Well, yes, physically killing somebody, right? And it's not the fact of killing somebody, it's the fact of that, that, that premeditated killing, the planning. Now, Jesus says, that's the physical, right? In the Old Testament, right? You murder, you shall not murder. That's one of the commandments, right, of the ten. But then Jesus says, you've heard that has been said, but I say, if anybody's angry, with his brother without a cause, you've committed murder already. Anger! There it is! Again! Are you a murderer? Well, no, I've never killed anybody. Have you ever hated somebody? You ever been angry towards somebody without a cause? Oh, yeah. Okay. Keep looking at your branches. Keep looking at your fruit. What kind of fruit are you bearing? What defines you? Are you a murderer? Are you a murderer? What about drunkenness? That word drunkenness literally means intoxication of any kind of drink. Are you a drinker? You like to drink a little bit on the weekends? Like to hang out with the homies? Go, hey, let's kick it. Let's, you know, drink. Let's just have a couple beers. You know, we'll just, no, no big deal. And three, then four. Are you, are you a drunkard? Yeah. Is that what defines you? Are you a drunkard? Is that on your branch? And I know that so many people play games with this one because Jesus turned water into wine. Tell me, if drunkards don't inherit the kingdom of heaven according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, according to Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, and then you can go into Colossians chapter 3, and so on and so forth. If Jesus made a hundred and something plus gallons of 
alcoholic beverage to get people smashed that were already smashed, wouldn't it be wrong of him to say that drunkards don't inherit the kingdom of heaven? That would make no sense. He would be contradicting himself. Then why are you making people a bunch of drink? Right? Why? You don't do that. We don't do that. It's not okay. So let's keep going. Revelings. Revelings. Now, this may, this may shock you. Reveling. It's drinking parties that go late into the night. Does that define you? Are you a partier? You like to go out, enjoy some drinks, do a little bit of this, do a little bit of that, right? Get drunk, hang out. I know I did. I did plenty of that. Revelings, that's what that means. People who like to go out to drinking parties. People who like to go out until late at night. Is that a characteristic that defines you? Is that on your branch? Now, those that do any of the things that we've mentioned tonight, that do is literally an action, a work, a practice. If you practice, you work, you act. If these are all literally on your branches, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. This is the fruit that if you do not bear good fruit, you will be cut down and cast into the fire. You don't want these on your tree, guys. So I guess if, if you start to listen, you're like, man, I'm, I'm examining myself. I'm looking at my tree. Do I have any of these fruits on my tree? Are any of these characteristics of me, do they define me who I am? And listen, yeah, that's not who I am. I'm this and I'm that and I'm this. Let's get real. Are any of these fruits, did you see them in you? And you're not supposed to be looking at somebody else. I don't want you in the back going. <laughs> you need to be looking at yourself going. The dude that caused all of my problems my entire life, I could never blame on the devil. I could never blame on my dad or my mom. I could never blame, blame on you or somebody else or my, my employer didn't give me the upper hand and, and they did this to me. Nope. If I want to see the person that caused all my issues, give me a mirror. I'm going to show them to you. It was me. It was me. So, let's go on to a couple of others. Let's keep examining your tree. I'll examine mine. What about taking God's name in vain? Any of us in here using God's name as a curse word? Taking Jesus' name in vain? What about saying, oh my, taking his name in vain? Is that on your tree? What about breaking the Sabbath? Anybody do that? Working on the Holy Sabbath day when God says, do not perform any work? Is that on your tree? What about dishonoring your parents? Anybody dishonor their parents? Look at your own tree. Don't look at somebody else. Look at your own tree. Dishonor your parents? Yeah, some of you, hey, your parents... I pray that they're with the Lord. They may be gone already. I still have parents. My mom and my dad asked me to do something, I do it. Not that I'm excited about doing it, but because God says, honor your father and your mother. You didn't miss, did you miss the footnote where it said until you move out of the house? Because that's not in there. Honor your father and your mother. Do you know what's interesting is that when you, if you know how to honor your father and mother, you'll know how to honor God. You learn honor and reverence and fear in your parents, I think, first. And then you learn how to fear God. If you have no honor or respect for your, for your parents, you're never going to have that for God. None. So, are any of us dishonoring our parents? What about, what about is any of us committing the, the act of murder? Do we have hatred in our hearts? What about lying? According to the book of Revelation, liars inherit the fire. It was just a white lie. Listen, it was blue and brown and orange and pink. They're all good except the real lie you can't. No, all lying is bad. If you are a liar, if a liar is on the branches, it's one of the fruit, you're a liar, it only goes to show you who you are and who you belong to. Jesus says you are of the Father, your father, the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. Anybody that practices lying, you know who your daddy is, and it's not him. Do you find lying on your, on your branch? Are you a liar? 
What about coveting? Do you covet people's stuff? You're not content? I wish I had what they had. I want what they want. I, I, I want to do I want. Godliness with contentment is great gain, Peter says. Are you not content? Are you coveting? What about stealing? Have you ever stolen anything? No matter how small, no matter how big, you're a thief. Is that fruit that bears on your branch, are you a thief? Is that what describes you? And yeah, I've met people that are like, yeah, proud of it. That's sad. Those are examples of and characteristics and actions and attributes of all bad fruit. And if you are bearing these things on your tree, your tree is corrupt. And I fear for you and for me because if we don't produce good fruit, then the ax is laid to the root of the trees and we're going to get cut off because we're dead and we're going to be thrown into the fire. Let's look at verse 22, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. So let's do the same. Let's go through the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Now, examine your branches. Do you have any of those fruits of the Holy Spirit? Let's look at them. First one mentioned was love. This is for God and for others. Do you love God? Do you love others? Do you see that as one of the fruits that you're bearing a good fruit on your branch? What about joy? And if you ever want to see a, a, an extended definition of love, read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Okay? God loves to define His own words. Joy. It's gladness. It's happiness. Is that an attribute of yours? Do you have joy? Are you happy? Are you, or are you the most miserable, per, miserable person to be around? Man, this person's just so happy all the time, and this person's just so negative. Right? So the point is, do you have joy? Do you have gladness and happiness? Let's keep looking at your branches. What about peace? Do you have rest? Do you have harmony with other people? Do you have harmony? Is there harmony? Let's look at the next one. What about, so love, joy, peace. What about long-suffering? Are you patient? Are you patient? Are you, are you slow to avenge? Or are you quick to avenge? Well, they did this to me. I'm going to make sure that I get it right back real fast and in a hurry. Are you slow to avenge? Are you patient? Guys, you've heard this a hundred million times from this stage. Probably less than. That was an exaggeration. I love the patience of God. That's my favorite attribute. That's my personal opinion. That, that, that patience is my favorite attribute of God because even Peter says in 2 Peter 3.15 that the patience of God is our salvation. How so? Because instead of destroying us and crushing us in our wickedness, God has been patient with every person in this room, giving them and me an opportunity to repent, to turn. My dad didn't come to Christ till he was 40. I didn't come to Christ till I was 21. Look at all that time. And we can't handle 30 seconds of somebody driving five under the speed limit. Right? But he waited for 21 years for little old me. I love God's patience. I'm thankful I didn't die in that overdose. I'm thankful I didn't die in that drunk driving accident. I'm thankful I didn't get shot by the police when I was running from them twice in Kansas City. I thank the Lord that He didn't let me die. Wow. Thank you, God, that you were patient with me. 
So now I have a message to go tell all the people in the streets, hey, bro, God's been super patient with you. What are you talking about? You're alive. (laughs) Do you have patience? It is an attribute of God. Do you have that same patience? Is that a fruit that you're bearing? What about gentleness? Are you kind? Are you not threatening? Think about that. Are you kind? Is that a fruit that you're bearing on your tree? What about goodness? That word goodness literally means upright in heart and life. You're upright. You have a strong moral compass. You have a strong moral behavior. What you do, you desire it to be right in the sight of God. Whether somebody's watching or they're not, you have a strong moral compass. You have integrity. What about faith? Now, interestingly enough, we know that God obviously defines faith in Hebrews 11.1, right? This faith that's defined here is literally means somebody that's trustworthy, that can be relied on, somebody that is faithful. Can somebody say that about you? Oh, they're trustworthy. No, they're a flake. Can they be relied on? Nope. They never show up. Are you faithful? Are you faithful? What about meekness? Meekness is, again, gentleness, but it's power reserved. You have all the grit, you have all the strength and all this power, but it's reserved. That's that humility. That's that meekness. It's power reserved. Yeah, I could do all of this, but I choose not to. Why? Because I don't need to. My strength is in God. What about temperance? Temperance is defined as self-control. It's a power over passions, power over desires. Is that what defines you? Do you have that bearing on your tree? Remember, inspect your own. Quit looking at each other. Inspect your own. Is that on your tree? What about being Christ-like? Are you Christ-like? When people look at your life, do you look more like the devil or Jesus? Answer yourself. Are you bearing fruits of purity? Are you living a pure lifestyle? What about holiness? Are you separate? Is your life defined as being set apart for the working of God, for the will of the Lord and not your own? Are you holy? Because like Peter said, he said, be you holy for I am holy. Are you producing fruits on your branches right now of holiness? What about righteousness? What about light? Let your light so shine. That's got to be a fruit that we're bearing, right? What about truth? Is that a fruit on your tree? On the corrupt tree, it's, it's lie. It's liar. On the good tree, it's people who tell the truth. At any cost, no matter what, whether it hurts you or it helps you, you tell the truth. These are all good fruit. Are we producing any of those fruits? Do we live a crucified life with Christ? Have we put the flesh to death? Because notice, and I understand it's not a popular verse, but Galatians 5.24 says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. They've put it to death. How many of you have ever cried out to God and said, Lord, put my wicked, fleshly, selfish self to death. Put me to death and come and live in me. That I wouldn't live for Cody Carr anymore, but I would live for Jesus. Right? And if you're still in Galatians 5, look in Galatians 6 real quick. In Galatians 6, verses 7 through 8, listen, look at verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Amen. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Amen. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But 
He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life, or life everlasting. So it's the message of sowing and reaping. And I'm not talking about giving of tithes. It's a message of sowing and reaping. What I'm talking about is if you live for the flesh, if you live for the world, you're going to reap corruption. The fruits on your tree are going to be bad fruits and you're going to reap corruption if you are living. So if you want to sow to the flesh, you want to live for the flesh, you want to live for the world, then you're going to reap corruption. But if you want to live for God through His Spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. I don't want to have corrupt fruits from a corrupt life. That's not my interest. I don't want that. I don't know about you guys, but if you've been inspecting your own tree right now, if you've been inspecting your fruits, and you don't like what you see, praise the Lord. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Here's the reality, guys, is that every one of us has been born in sin. The Apostle Paul says there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. We were born in sin. According to Psalms chapter 51, 5, David says, In sin did my mother conceive me. We were born in sin. No one had to teach us to bear evil fruits. We were good at it. Anybody have to teach you how to lie? Anybody have to teach you how to steal? Dishonor your parents? How do I know that? Well, I've had four one-year-olds and four two-year-olds. And all them dudes willingly will tell me how I'm supposed to do stuff at two years old. Or if I say, turn that off, no. Oh, you misunderstood me. So this time, I'm going to tell you again, but with a little bit more force. Do you see what I'm saying? We are born in sin, corrupt, bearing fruits of, of, of a corrupt life. We need a new tree. Every one of us. So we were good. So if, if you're looking at your tree tonight and you're, and you're examining your branches and you sit back and say like, I see that. And maybe I'm looking at it and it's like, man, I'm a corrupt tree. I'm a corrupt tree. I want, I want to be the good tree. I want to bear good fruits. Like I, I want the good. I don't want to bear the bad. How do I get the fruits of the Spirit? How do I get that? Well, praise the Lord. Let me show you. That's the blessing is I don't just want to tell you, say, this is what it is, and then say, all right, you guys have a good night. Hope you have a good tree. See you later. I want to show you how to get good fruit. I want to show you how to bear good fruit. Amen? Would you do me a favor and go to John chapter 15? So if any of you looked at your branches... And I'm going to look down at my paper because you guys are like, oh, you were looking at me and you were talking about me the whole time. Trust me, I'll get a phone call after church because somebody will be saying like, I can't believe it. He just preached about me the whole time. Hey, if the shoe, foot, shoe fits, kick it off, right? So the point is, is that if you've looked at your tree and you said, man, I'm bearing so much, so much evil fruit. I'm a corrupt tree, but I don't want to be that way. And I want to bear good fruit. Then this is going to be for you. This is going to be for you. Even if you are bearing good fruits and you want to bear more good fruits, this is going to be for you. This is how we get good fruits on our tree. John chapter 15. You guys there? John chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 1. So Jesus says, John 15, 1, I am the true vine. My Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, He takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, He purges it or prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, verse 9, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. So, what's the secret? Abide in Christ. In Christ in you. That's it. Abide in Christ. Jesus says a branch alone cannot bear any fruit. If you're not plugged into Jesus, you'll never bear any type of fruit that's good. For example, I encourage every one of you to go home. Find a tree. Go out to the bluffs if you want to. Find a tree. Cut off a branch and duct tape it to the, to the, to the trunk. Come back in a week, it's going to be dead. It didn't matter how close the branch was to the, to the life-giving source. If it's not plugged in, it's going to die. We need to abide in Christ. If we don't abide in Christ, we're not going to produce any good fruit. So much so, Jesus says that the branch can bear no fruit without me. John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. So, who are we hoping to bear the fruit in us? Jesus. I can't produce no good fruit on my own. I need Jesus. And if I'm abiding in Him, and He's abiding in me, then I'm going to produce what I'm supposed to produce. I'm going to have a bunch of fruit on my tree because it's a byproduct of Jesus living in me. If Jesus is living in you, then you're going to see the fruits of the Spirit. Now, real fast, it, just in case if you missed it up until this point, they're called the fruits of of the Holy Spirit. What am I saying? It's the Holy Spirit's fruits. It's not your fruit. These are the good fruits of the flesh. No. These are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. These are not my fruits. They're not your fruits. They're His fruits. Amen. And if He's living in us, then we're going to produce those fruits. Does that make sense? Yes. Well, let's keep looking at this just for a second. So every Branch, number one, in Christ is pruned. Why do you prune a tree? You cut away anything so that nutrients doesn't go to another place where it's not supposed to so that more fruit can grow. What's he saying? God is the husbandman, so God's going to go out to his field, go out to his branches that's abiding in the vine, which is Christ. And he's going to go to you personally, and he's going to cut off anything that's dead or that's not producing. He's going to cut it away for you. Why? So that you can grow more. Do you see? Also, abide, we talked about it, abiding in Christ, and you will produce a fruit, for without Jesus you can do nothing. Abide is literally defined as living in, waiting upon, remaining with. Are you living in Christ? Are you waiting upon Christ? Are you remaining in Him? Is He your life? I don't really spend any time with Jesus. I mean, you know. If you're not abiding in Him, you're not going to produce anything. Remember, go cut a branch down. Take it home with you. Bring it back. See if it still looks the same. It's not. You need to be plugged into Christ. You need to be living in Him through His Word, in prayer, in gathering, in fellowship with the body. You need to be abiding in Christ. Because if you're in Him, He's in you. And He's given you what you need to produce all this good fruit. So abiding in Christ. Okay. Okay. How can I abide in Christ? Well, number one, the Bible says that we just read it in John 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love. So how can I abide in Christ? Keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous, according to Jesus' words. Why? Because if he's in you doing the work, then it's not a hard thing to do. Just like no apple tree is suffering to produce apples. It's just what it does. It's what it is. Right? You ever see any sweat build up at the bottom of a tree? 
It's trying really hard. It's working really hard to produce some good fruits this week. No. It's what it does. It's a fruit tree. It's going to produce fruits. Who would have ever guessed? It's what it is. It's what it does. So number one, you want to abide in Christ? Keep His commandments. Didn't Jesus say that at the end of Matthew chapter 28 when He gave the Great Commission? Right? Go baptize in my name and command them to do what? To keep all the commandments. To, to keep what I have said. To do what I have said. Right? Okay? Let's keep looking at this about abiding in Christ. Right? In the book of Psalms chapter 1, listen to this. I'm already there. Just listen to me. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel or the advice of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in a season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Amen. So how can I produce good fruit? Obey the commandments of the Lord. And what did he just say? His delight is in the law of the Lord, in His law, in the Word of God. You're meditating day and night. You are meditating in the Word of the Lord. And if you are meditating, you're abiding, you're living in God's Word, then you're going to be like a tree that's planted by the river of water that brings forth His fruit in season, and His leaf will never wither, and whatsoever He does shall prosper. Because you're abiding. You're meditating on the Word of God day and night. You're obeying His commandments. You're meditating on His Word day and night. What's another one? Jeremiah 17. Check this out. I'm going to turn there real quick. You guys listen to me. Jeremiah 17. Verse 7. Bless you. Verse 7. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreads out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat comes, but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So we're abiding in Christ. And because we're in Him and He's in us, then we're producing fruit. But how are we abiding? We're living in Him. We're remaining in Him. We're waiting upon Him. We are meditating on His Word day and night. We're obeying His commandments of which we're meditating on. Right? And then we're trusting in Him as God. Hebrews 11.6 11, says, For without faith it's impossible to please God. For those that come to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So you're trusting in Him as God. And you'll be like that tree planted by the river that's always producing fruit, that always has green leaves. That's beautiful year-round. They're like the little two trees that were sitting amongst this field that was completely dead. But they stood out. They stood out. So I had mentioned that it's called the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So it's God's Spirit. And we cannot produce these fruits on our own. We need the Holy Spirit of God in us. And these fruits will not be a chore to produce. Again, rather a byproduct. It will be of Christ living inside of us. So if Jesus is living inside you right now, you could see those fruits that I just mentioned in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. You should be able to spot those in your branches. Like, Man, I was a really good liar. I, not anymore. Man, I was really good at committing adultery. Not anymore. Right? You start looking at it, it's like, wow, man, thank you, Lord. Like, this is the fruit that I'm bearing on my tree now. Simply, if you want the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you want to bear good fruits that gives glory to God, you need more of Jesus. You need more of Jesus and less of yourself. That's what I need. That's what you need. What is it? John the Baptist said in John chapter 3, verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. I need more of Jesus. I need less of Cody. That'll be the best thing not only for me, but for you. That'll be the best thing for my coworkers, for my neighbors, for my family. I need more of Jesus and I need less of this guy. Does that make sense? Okay, let's keep looking at this. We need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled with Christ. Remember, if it's the fruits of the Spirit and you don't have the Holy Spirit, then you're not going to produce these fruits. You're not born again. 
We must be born again, according to John chapter 3, right? Baptized in the, in the water and in the Spirit. We need to be baptized. If you want these fruits, the only way that you're going to bear them is through the Holy Spirit. Now, remember how at the beginning I talked about that our life is not just to repent, forsake, return to the Lord, believe in Him as Savior, believe in the cross, believe in the resurrection, the gospel, the great news, and then just sit on our hands in a church pew for 25 years. What you're supposed to do is after you've received the Lord and He's filled you with this Holy Spirit is to go be a fruitful tree. To go bring a bunch of fruit that affects everybody around you. Affects them. That you're a bright, shining light that when people say, it's like, man, I want some of that. I want what he's got. And that person, if you talk to him or her, they should be able to tell you, it's not me, it's Jesus. Do you want some of him? Because you can have as much as you want. Right? Because whoever comes to him, the Father says, Jesus says, John 6, 37, all that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast him away. I just have to come. You want to be saved? Romans 10, 13. Read that. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that we've crossed that bridge, right? You've become a new creature. God is working in your life. You've been baptized in the water and in the Holy Spirit. It's important. You need to be baptized. Baptism of repentance. You need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay, you need to be born again. And now that you're born again, now you're going to be used as a light in the darkness. You're going to be used as a city that's set on a hill. That's not ever hidden. But that's bright whenever you see it. Right? Brighter than Las Vegas at nighttime. Right? City on a hill, does that make sense now? Okay. You'll be the flavor when there's none of it around you. The salt. That's your job in Christ. It's to go magnify and bring glory to God's name. How? By producing good fruit. Which can be picked by others which will affect them in a good way so that they might produce good fruit. More of Jesus, less of us. Now, if you're still in John 15, if you look at John 14, which is the chapter before 15, I don't know if we know how to count, but 14, 15. Go to 14. John 14. Look at this promise here. John chapter 14, we're starting in verse 14, 14, 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he might abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world sees me no more, but you see me, and because I live, you shall live also. Here's a promise. I'm going to send my spirit, and he's going to abide in you. That's a promise. Are you telling me that you've been born again, but you don't have the spirit of God? Was Jesus lying? I'm going to send you the comforter. I'm going to send you my spirit. You will be full of me. Amen? Now, again, Jesus promised to send it. How shall we receive the Holy Spirit in us? Yes, I understand. Baptism of the Holy Spirit, people laid on hands. You read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. They received the seal, which is the Holy Spirit, after they believed. You got all these things. But I just want to make it simple for you. We've talked tonight about the fruits of the flesh, the wicked, rotten, corrupt fruits of the flesh. And then we've talked about the good fruits of the Holy Spirit. And we all want those things, right? And then we said, well, how can I get the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Well, you need to abide in Christ. You need more of Jesus and less of you. Well, what's that require? I need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit because it's the fruits of the Spirit, right? And then you say, well, hold on a second. How do I get the Holy Spirit? I'm going to make it super simple for you. You guys turn to Luke chapter 11, please. Every one of you should have a great desire right now to want to bear fruits of God's Spirit. Because you know and I know 
that the trees that aren't producing good fruit are going to be cut down and cast into the fire. Luke 11, verse 9. You guys there? Amen. Okay. And I say to you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened to you. Everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks, it shall be opened to you. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that's a father, will he give him a stone? Or he that asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You want the Holy Spirit? Ask. Let's just simplify it all. You don't have to go to you know, Bible school. don't have to go to Bible college and get a doctorate in theology so that you can understand that if you want to be moved by Jesus, if you want to bear the fruits of God inside your body so that you can be a light to the world that's completely dark and salt to the earth that has no flavor, then you need to understand this. Ask God and He will finish the work. It's simple. How simple is that? We'll say, well, ask and you receive. Seek and you shall find. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm really asking the Lord for Mercedes Benz right now. I'm really trying to get a little bit up, you know, a little bit more money. You know, that'd be nice. And I'm re- Look at the context of that. A dad, we being evil. Dads, moms, do you know how to give good gifts to your kids? Yeah, you do. You know how to go without on your paycheck. You know how to go a few weeks in advance. For example, you got Christmas coming up. What are you going to do? Oh, well, I went into some crazy debt. By February 1st, I'll finally be able to have some money for my household. You're going to spend all of your money. You know how to give good gifts to your children. And you're evil. How much more can God give who's good? Matter of fact, how much more is God willing to give the Holy Spirit to anybody that asks Him for it? That's what I want. I want God's Spirit to be fully alive inside me to where I burn and everywhere I go is start fires. Amen? Amen? You should want that same thing. So if you look tonight, you've heard tonight, man, I want to bear the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Well, you need God's Spirit to bear His fruits. And you're like, well, I really want to get His, I I really want God's Spirit. Not for the sake of gain, but for the sake of, I want to bring glory to my Father according to John chapter 15, verse 8. Jesus, you said, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Well, I want to bring glory. I want to bring honor. I want to bring praise to Him by bearing this fruit. But I need Him to do it. So I just have to ask. Ask, Lord, I want Your Holy Spirit. Lord, would You give it to me? so that I could bear fruits to Your name, that You would be glorified, that I would be less and You would be more, that there would be less of me and more of You, that I could bear good fruits and You would cut away every fruit, every branch that's producing corrupt fruit. I have a prayer that I want to ask the Lord that I wrote yesterday, but before I say the prayer, did you want anything? Did you want? Okay. Let's pray. Would you guys lift up holy hands? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, every one of us, my God, tonight is performing self-examination. Some of us have realized tonight, Lord, that we are producing corrupt, evil, wicked fruit on our branch. And we don't want to produce those things. We want to produce the fruit of your Holy Spirit. According to your word, Lord, you said that if we ask for your Holy Spirit, you would give, you would give him to us. I ask right now, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask that you would teach us how to abide in you by meditating on your word day and night by obeying 
your commandments, by trusting in you as God, by living in you, Jesus. We ask, Lord, that you would allow us to produce good fruits that would bring glory to your name. We ask that these fruits would make us lights in the darkness, according to Matthew 5.16. We ask, God, that everything that we bear, because we're abiding in you, would bring glory to your name, that the world would look at us and see your saving power. They would see your ability to make something that is dead come to life. Thank you, God, for your fruits. Thank you for your word and your truth. God, we love you in this house. We boast in your name above every other name. We love you, God. We'd ask right now, put our flesh to death. We want more of you and less of us. In Jesus' name, amen.